<laughs> I'm just here to maybe find for myself a, a new longsword, said the undead elf, striking a bold pose at the front of the party. He was clad in the strongest of steel armor, ready to brave any danger that lurked within the darkened halls. You guys can keep everything else. I, I don't want it. A blade in both hands to wield it is nothing compared to the speed of a good dagger or short sword. The undead rogue said mockingly as he took up the second position in the group. His daggers were at the ready, both dripping with a poison that he had prepared before the group descended into the depths of the haunted ruin. Unlike the warrior elf, who seemed so overly confident it bordered on stupidity, the rogue would never be so careless. He was ready, his eyes darting into the various corners of the room, scouting for any would-be threats. Not even a mouse escaped his trained senses. He was prepared for anything, Boo! cried the elf suddenly appearing in the rogue's face. The rogue jumped, his body tensing as he quickly raised his daggers to his own defense. Perhaps not as ready as he should have been. Stop doing that! You <laughs> I got you! I got you! Taunted the elf. He'd already done this once before, and the rogue had fallen for it then, as he did now. Unamused, the rogue grumbled and sneered in annoyed disgust. How he hated this gloating fool of a warrior who teased him further with his smug and smiling face. Why him, of all people, to lead us in a place such as this? The rogue thought to himself. Third from the front, the monk laughed with a shake of his head. <laughs> Listen, mate, you have to relax. Don't be so on edge. You want a drink? I guarantee it'll calm you. The monk offered to the rogue a sip from his water skin, which did not contain water, no, not water at all. As the skin was offered, the rogue could smell the dark, thick, and foul alcoholic beverage within, some sort of import from a land he was not aware of, nor did he wish to know. No thanks. I'm... I'm fine. He regained his composure. Calm and collected, he lowered his daggers and ignored the elf who had returned to walking on ahead, chuckling still at his own foolishness. Eh? See yourself? More for little old me. <laughs> you don't know what you're missing out on. The monk took for himself a mouthful of the dark brew and returned the water skin to his belt. Behind the three, their warlock, who was keeping somewhat behind the monk for security, suddenly spoke up sounding rather annoyed at the sudden stop in their adventure. Did we really come here to make jokes and drink beer? Let's get a move on already. This place isn't going to rob itself. It wasn't just another haunted castle, the kind the group had delved into many times before. It was a school of necromancy that had been founded by the Cult of Darkness, a religious group dedicated to finding the secret of immortality through what they called the Blessing of Undeath. These mad cultists had built for themselves secret schools of study all across the land. Some hidden in sewers, others in caves, or, like this one, under a manor located on a small island in the center of a lake. For years, these halls remained unexplored by the outside world, known only to those who studied necromancy within. But with a few bribes, and a few threats of having some souls removed and placed into binding shards, Compliments of the group's warlock, of course. Information was extracted, and the school was soon discovered. It was said that here was where the deepest of necromantic knowledge was kept, and, to any lost soul willing, the secret to immortality itself. The madmen had discovered it, and that made the warlock delight with a joy the party hadn't seen in, well, never. Dark rituals, spells, and forbidden knowledge. Can you imagine all that is hidden down here? The group had continued onward, and the warlock, who stayed close to the monk still, practically sang at the idea of what discoveries they'd make in the shadows of these halls. Probably just more dust, the monk said sarcastically. We haven't seen a single undead or cult bloke since we got down here. Some secret base. Maybe they're just trying to mislead us. Just saying. Don't say that. 
The warlock now stepped ahead of the monk, storming past the rogue, as well as the elf, who was surprised to see his friend take the lead so suddenly. We're bound to run into someone or something eventually. And when we do, you three can kill it. I'll steal from it, and everyone goes home happy. But we need to keep going deeper. You're really on about this whole immortality thing, aren't you, warlock? Said the rogue with a sigh. Yeah, you've been acting so hell-bent on the idea since that guy told us about this place. The elf crossed his arms across his broad chest. It's not all that it's cracked up to be, you know. The rogue and I could probably agree on that. Yes, yes indeed we do. For you see, both the elf and the rogue were cursed with undeath themselves, transformed into the very monsters that the cultists sought to remake the world into. And yet they both had regained their minds, or most of it, as now they sought to undo the work of the ones who had cursed them. That's what they told the group anyway, but in reality, the elf still dreamed of his sword, and the rogue, his own pursuit of gold and trinkets, hoarded away to- Boo! Cried the elf suddenly again. Stop! Shouted the rogue, taken aback a third time. The elf bellowed with laughter. Oh, sorry, uh, did I interrupt the author's description of your character's purpose? Yes, actually. Oi, oi, sh 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 hush. The monk said suddenly, speaking up. I think I hear something. All of them heard it. It was some sort of movement coming from deeper within the ruined halls. Louder and louder it grew, moving toward them, drawn by the shouting and the sheer stupidity of those who would raise their voices in a haunted school of necromancy. Nice going, you stupid elf, said the rogue, readying his daggers. I wasn't the one who got scared. Right, you two, so, whatever this thing is, let's ready ourselves for it. The monk stepped forward, taking his place beside the two, before drawing a staff that was hanging at his back. The elf's two-handed sword was at the ready, the rogue's daggers still dripped their poison, and the monk's staff seemed to glow a soft green in the darkness of the halls. And the sound was drawing closer, closer, and closer still. <laughs> ready? asked the elf. As I'll ever be replied the rogue. All right, I got your backs. All of you. Nodded the monk. A pause. And you, warlock? Asked the elf, awaiting an answer. Warlock? Turning, the three noted him, hiding nearby behind the remnants of an old bench that had been mostly rotted away by time. Only the top of his head poked out from behind the remains of the wooden backrest. From there, hidden mostly from view, he spoke with a wave of his hand to the group. Oh yeah, all set over here. Uh, let's do it. Warlock, get your cowardly ass back over here, or I'll drag you back. Said the undead rogue with his teeth gritted as not to make too much noise. No time to worry about that, mate. Eyes full. Advised the monk to his rogue companion. The three held their ground, staring into the void before them. The sound of footsteps was drawing nearer, but they were slow. Awkward, as if the beam from which the sound emanated shambled more than walked. Closer and closer it came, right to the cusp of being visible in what little light our heroes maintained when it stopped. The elf tightened his grip on his sword. The monk glanced to the rogue, whose gaze had not flinched from the hallway before them. The warlock peeked from behind his hiding place. Then, from the darkness, it sprang! <coughs> With a blood-curdling screech leapt a mangled creature of rotting flesh and misshapen bone. Its mouth hung wide with rows of broken, jagged teeth. <coughs> it flung itself at the monk, the only living member of the group that was not cowering behind the time-worn furniture. The monk had just enough time to block the jaws of the ghoulish creature with his staff, but the ravenous assault had knocked him to the floor. The creature gnawed on the wooden staff. Its mad yellow eyes were set on its prey, and its claws thrashed wildly, desperate to sink its teeth into the monk, who was now not only holding back the undead horror, but also his lunch, as the creature's fetid breath assailed his nostrils. 
The rogue, not wasting any time, rotated one of the daggers he carried and threw himself at the creature, driving the blade firmly into its head. The creature ceased its assault. Its head spanned to face the rogue with an unsettling crack and shriek. The monk seized the opportunity to kick the monstrosity away with both legs and jumped to his feet. The creature stumbled back and shook its head. The rogue's dagger still protruding from its crown, it raised its claws and bared its twisted teeth, ready to fight like a cornered animal. All right, you ugly, maggot-ridden dung heap. I'll be having that dagger back. Then I'm going to put you back into the dirt. Taunted the rogue. No, wait! Bellowed the elf who so far had not struck a single blow against the group's decomposing assailant. Wait! Are you insane? That thing just tried to eat the monk! Yeah, I'm usually the forgiving sort, but not when some git's trying to eat my damn face, said the monk, keeping his eyes on the shambling horror that could strike again at any moment. You guys, it's just a little ghoul. We probably spooked him with all of our shouting. Oh, we spooked him. All right. The monk remarked sarcastically. You just need to know how to talk to them. Isn't that right, little guy? The ghoul twitched anxiously as the undead elf extended his hand towards it. Well, you're just a silly little ghoul, aren't you? Well, when we get out of here, I'll find you some marrow-rich bones to gnaw on. Yes, I will. The elf spoke as if talking to a house pet. Curiously, the ghoul began to approach him, and after cautiously examining the elf's gauntleted hand, began to gently chew on it. Oh, he likes me. I think I'll name you... Rotballs. The elf withdrew his hand from the ghoul's mouth and began gently scratching it behind what used to be its ear. Flakes of skin crumbled away, and the ghoul dribbled a pungent fluid. It was at ease. The rogue and the monk watching the bazaar scene before them, slowly lowered their weapons. What a disgusting creature. The warlock, who had been watching the encounter play out from the safety of his hiding spot, was now back beside his companions. Huh, banned your ball sack back there, did you? The warlock shot a glare at the monk for his remark and then moved to address the elf. If you're quite done making friends, I suggest we move on. The secrets of this place are not going to reveal themselves, and I for one do not wish to remain here any longer than is necessary. Mm, Have it your way, warlock. The elf shrugged and pet his new friend one last time before peering into the darkness ahead. Huh. Well, I won't be cleaving any monsters if I can't see them. Anybody got a light? Hold out your sword, commanded the warlock. And as the elf did, he ran his hands along the blade, mumbling words only recognizable to those who were accustomed to sorcery. From the sword burst forth a green flame that illuminated the hall around them. Nice! I knew we brought you along for something, warlock. Just get moving. The elf led the way into the formerly darkened hall. The warlock followed after carefully edging his way around the gently growling goo. The monk followed more confidently, and the rogue, after nonchalantly pulling his dagger out from the ghoul's head, followed suit. The ghoul, after watching the group of heroes fade into the darkness, began gnawing on a nearby bone. The heroes wandered the desolate halls of the School of Necromancy for some time, now wary that there could be more creatures lurking just out of reach of the limited light they had. Several times, the warlock looked over his shoulder as if to glance something moving in the flickering of the enchanted sword's fire. His paranoia was not unfounded as both the monk and the rogue were also uneasy, although far more composed than their robed companion, and Both could have sworn that they saw things moving amongst the ever-increasing mounds of bones within the deepest levels of the accursed ruin. Only the elf strode forward with confidence, as if he were strolling through a quaint meadow and not a dungeon of aberrant deeds and unspeakable evil. At last, there came another light in the darkness, dim at first, but there was an unmistakable glow of torchlight. As the group approached, they saw that the torches framed an ornate door covered in skulls and a language unknown to all but those who would practice the darkest of magics. Gentlemen, I think we may have found what we're looking for, 
spoke the warlock quietly, but with a mild excitement. A fancy door? Asked the elf. No, you don't. The door is covered in necromantic inscriptions. Whatever is beyond is probably powerful, and more importantly, valuable beyond belief. Hey, hold up. You fellas hear that? Said the monk to the group. The four quieted and listened carefully to the ruin around them. It was faint, but they could hear it amidst the foreboding ambiance of the dungeon they found themselves in. There was chanting. It's coming from behind that door, whispered the rogue, and he was right. Whoever or whatever was performing the unholy chant was on the other side of the ornate door before them. Just our luck, eh? We run into the only necromancer left in this damn place. If it's not something worse. I'm not about to turn back when we're this close. We need a plan of engagement, said the warlock, his greed outweighing his usual cowardice. I know. I'll kick the door down, smash any skeletons or ghouls in my way, and then cleave this necromancer in two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have a better plan? The monk pondered for a moment. Well, we could lure whoever it is out here. Make a ruckus, you know. And once they step outside, we wallop them. It could work. Forget that. Let me go in solo. I am the quietest. I'll sneak up on our friend and slit his throat before he can even cast a spell. The rogue said with confidence. The warlock mused for a moment. I suppose I could use a scrying spell to peer into the chamber ahead. If I know his location, I might be able to cast a spell that catches him off guard when we attack. The heroes considered their options. If the being in the next chamber was indeed an experienced necromancer, they would have to choose their course of action carefully. That settles it. I'm going in, said the rogue, already making for the ornate door. I'll return once the deed is done, and then we can have our fill of whatever trinkets our corpse-defiling friend might be hoarding. Do be careful not to damage any items he might be carrying. They could be enchanted and of use to me, the warlock instructed, thinking again of his coveted prize. The rogue, not one for taking orders from a bumptious hedge wizard, pointed one of his daggers towards his robed party member. Watch yourself, warlock, otherwise only one member of our group will be returning home alive. Noting the seriousness in his companion's tone, the warlock's ordinarily sharp tongue was now held firmly behind his teeth. The rogue, certain that he could see sweat already forming from beneath the warlock's cowl, turned away from the pompous conjurer and placed a bony hand upon the door. Although some of his senses had long been dulled by his unliving condition, the rogue could have sworn he felt a coldness run through his arm and down his spine. He shook it off as nothing more than a momentary apprehension. After all, he needed to be cautious. The door was old and heavy. Too hasty an opening would cause its hinges to squeak and alert the necromancer who dwelt just beyond. Most fortuitously, the door's initial opening made little noise at all. The rogue had gently pushed open the morbid entry, allowing him to peer into the lair of the defiler of graves. The chamber ahead was spacious, and an unnatural lurid glow flickered across its walls, emanating from enchanted braziers. From what vision the rogue had over the necromancer's inner sanctum, he could spy rows of dust-coated sarcophagi, all of which had been disturbed, as evidenced by the absence of their stone lids. This fell chamber must have once been the ancestral crypt of whatever noble family once ruled these blighted lands, the rogue mused. The former patriarchs of that lineage now most likely shambled about these darkened halls, pulled by the unseen shackles of a degenerate madman. Unless... The rogue was quick to notice the absence of any guards or ghouls within the macabre sanctum. Surely this necromancer was not foolish enough to leave himself vulnerable at the heart of his domain. No, no he was not. The rogue knew, within each of the lidless sarcophagi ahead lay a decayed warrior, seemingly slumbering in eternal rest, but in actuality ready to leap out upon any who would dare disturb their master's sanctum. These great men in life were now reduced to being the personal guard of a- Hey, uh, are you going in? Uh, do you need me to come with you? The elf asked, brandishing his sword with eager anticipation which still burned with enchanted fire. The elf's words surprised the rogue, as if an enemy had snuck up behind him. 
Who would be so stupid as to raise their voice at a moment as precarious as this? No! Shut up, you idiot! The rogue hissed at the elf. I'm going in. Stay quiet. The rogue pointed a bony finger at the elf and then pushed against the door, carefully. The door opened inch by inch, producing only the faintest of creaks, which to the rogue reverberated as if it was a dragon's roar. Once the rogue had an ample opening, he slipped his slim frame inside and vanished from the group's view. The door closed gently behind him. Then there was silence. On the other side of the door, the rogue dropped himself low. If the sarcophagi contained the reanimated remains of the Lord's long past, as he suspected, he would want to avoid being in sight above the lip of their stone caskets. He crawled his way across to the dust and cobweb-ridden floor and used the nearest of the sarcophagi as cover, being careful not to lay a hand on it. Peering his head around the stone casket's periphery, the rogue now had a sufficient view along the center of the crypt. The rows of deteriorated stone coffins led to a raised granite altar, Modest in appearance, a relic from a more pious time. Now any spiritual value that altar once held had been stripped away, its surface defaced, its piety sullied. For its form had been blackened and atop it sat no sacred vessels but arcane tools, bones and viscera, the repulsive remains of some obscene experiment or ungodly ritual. Before the altar knelt the current master of the castle and the perverse dungeon within its bowels, the chanting necromancer. Robed in black with a hood covering his head, the twisted sorcerer muttered the unknowable words of his sacrilegious incantation. To his side, resting upon the altar was a strange scythe, although the rogue knew this to be more than a simple farming tool. Indeed, it was a magical catalyst. The greatest practitioners of the arcane arts would craft their own after many years of disciplined study and practice. Unless, of course, they were some puffed-up self-important conjurer like the group's warlock. The rogue watched his mark for a short time. He observed that the necromancer's head was bowed in a form of reverence before a dark orb placed most prominently on the desecrated altar. What this object was, or what its function served, was an enigma to him, although he somehow knew that the warlock would be fascinated by it. After one final glance around the crypt, to be certain there were no unliving foes lurking outside of their stone caskets, the rogue crept forward. He thought about the possibility of throwing a knife into the back of the unassuming villain ahead of him, but such a move was risky. With just a word, the dark sorcerer could beckon the dead to his aid or reduce the rogue to a pile of ash. A throwing knife to the back may give the fiend enough time to draw breath, if he even breathed, for he too may be among the unliving. No, best to get in close, place a hand over his mouth and slit his throat, or take his head off, just to be sure. The rogue's blade was certainly sharp enough. Closer, the rogue drew to his prey. He had reached the end of the rows of sarcophagi and now lightly stepped up towards the raised altar. The necromancer still murmured to himself, unaware that his end was close. The rogue positioned himself behind the profane magician, readied his blade, and raised a free hand in preparation to grasp shut the sorcerer's mouth. Then he pounced, except he didn't. He had lunged towards the necromancer, but stopped. The rogue gathered himself. Surely after all these years he was suddenly not stricken with fear. No, no, of course not. He feared nothing, let alone some depraved loon living in the ruins of a decrepit castle. He readied his dagger once more and struck. Only once again he had stopped himself. Could he not bring himself to strike down the monster before him? Had fear paralyzed him? No, something was very wrong. The rogue determined that the best course of action now was for him to withdraw. Although he was no coward like his warlock companion, there was something gravely amiss here. The rogue attempted to step away from the hooded figure, only to find his legs were as rigid as the stone altar before him. Likewise, his arms were now completely frozen in place, and yet no observable change had come over him. It was at this moment of dire vulnerability that the necromancer stopped his chanting. Although the rogue has told himself he did not feel fear, as the darkly robed sorcerer before him reached for his scythe and stood to his feet, 
he felt an overwhelming sense of dread. The necromancer had turned about to face the rogue. There was neither surprise nor shock in his bearing. He was tall and still, a mask resembling an elongated skull concealing his face. And although the rogue could not see them, he could sense the gaze of the being's eyes looking down upon him. The same coldness that the rogue felt when he opened the door of the crypt was now biting at every fiber of his being, like a winter's midnight chill. The masked figure broke its silent stare and cast a gaze towards the door. From behind him, the rogue could hear the sounds of metal and bones scraping against stone. The necromancer's personal guard, the former lords of the castle, were rising from their graves. The monk gulped down an enormous swig of the alcoholic brew within his water skin and wiped his mouth with an alleviated sigh. The warlock, watching with disdain, couldn't help but break the silence. I do hope you'll be sober enough to swing that staff should another ghoul come skulking. Listen, this whole place has got me on edge. I need a little liquid courage to warm my heart and calm the nerves. If you know what I mean, answered the monk. Taking another, more conservative swig from his water skin, the warlock smirked beneath his cowl. He sensed an opportunity to mock the monk who had teased him for his earlier cowardice. I didn't know monks relied on alcohol to steady themselves. I always thought they were meant to be disciplined and free from fear. Yet here you are, knocking it back like a common drunkard. <laughs> hey now, I don't need a lecture on bravery from a bloke who suddenly finds his love of old furniture when his mates are in danger. Alright? The warlock, being firmly rebuked, quickly changed the subject. Ah, whatever. I wonder what's taking the rogue so long. Don't get your rope in a twist. He hasn't been that long, said the elf standing guard with his flaming sword held high. Anyway, uh, what are you hoping to find in this place, Warlock? Before the Warlock could answer, the monk interjected. It's the secret of immortality that he wants. He's practically had a stiffy the whole time just thinking about it. Quiet, you! Snapped the Warlock, having heard just about enough of the monk's teasing remarks. Like I said earlier, immortality isn't all it's cracked up to be. Uh, once you've been around long enough, the world begins to run out of new and exciting things. It it starts to feel more like a curse than a blessing, said the elf in an uncharacteristically solemn manner. The warlock sneered, insulted that a long-lived and now immortal elf would dare lecture him on the repercussions of immortality. You know what, elf? Perhaps I will become bored of eternal life, but I think I'll decide that for myself, after a few millennia. Besides, I don't know what you have to complain about. Unlike the rogue, your flesh hasn't rotted away, so your curse can't be all that bad. The monk, who was the most patient of the group, was beginning to tire of the warlock's condescension, and so decided to challenge him. What would you even do with eternal life? Spend all that time moaning? No. Obviously, I'd make use of the secret myself, but after that, well... I'm thinking there's plenty of exceedingly wealthy and powerful people that will pay through the nose to live forever, and I'd be happy to oblige them, if they can afford my price." The warlock explained, a smug sense of satisfaction rang in his voice. He believed his plan quite brilliant. Oh yeah? Well there's a lot of messed up people out there. Just look at this place. Do you think they wouldn't just force the secret out of you? Hell, they'd probably torture you for it. Now I don't mean to be rude, but you don't seem like the kind of guy to hold up under pressure for all eternity. For the first time on their journey, the warlock didn't immediately respond. He paused for a moment and considered the monk's reasoning. The half-inebriated dullard was not wrong. Perhaps his plan required some more thought. It was during this brief moment of silence that the three bickering heroes came to notice the sound of a cold wind blowing through the darkened halls of the ruin. Before the three of them knew it, a gust of cold air forced itself upon them. The torches that framed the ghastly ornate door that the rogue had slipped beyond guttered and snuffed themselves out. The three braced themselves against the unnatural gale. The monk leaned on his staff. The warlock clung to an old stone column, his robes blowing wildly in the wind. The elf propped himself against the wall whilst keeping a firm grip on his burning sword, the fires of which sputtered like a dying candle until eventually it blew out and the gale dissipated. Now there was silence 
and darkness. The monk took several deep gulps from his water skin. Will you stop drinking? Just bug off, you robed prat. Uh, Warlock, can you relight my sword? Asked the elf, stumbling around in the blackness. I can. Hold it out, instructed the warlock. The elf raised his blade, which struck the side of the stone column the warlock had used to find purchase with a loud clang. (laughs) Careful, you idiot! Sorry. The warlock mumbled the same occult language as before, desperate to regain some vision in this accursed place. The sword sparked, and a moment later a great green flame wreathed its way along the blade from the hilt. The elf swiftly raised his sword to cast its fiery light across the hall. Although the sight that was revealed in that viridescent glow would have been, to most, best left in the shadows. A ghastly throng of rattling bone and rotting flesh had surrounded our three heroes, as if carried in on that dreadful wind, or springing from the very darkness that had swallowed them. A hundred pairs of eyeless sockets fixed themselves upon the three unprepared adventurers. Among the horde stood a dozen lordly figures, though to call them lords in their present state would sully the noble title. Their flesh had long faded, their exquisite armor had corroded and blackened, and what was left of their corporeal form was now the property of the Maleficent Magus. With a shrieking howl, these black knights commanded their cadaverous host to attack. The undead fell upon our heroes, first swarming the monk, who, in his half-inebriated state, lacked the reflexes to repel the numerous skeletons that leapt upon him. He had only enough time to bark one defiant plea. Get off me, you dead hits! Before he was lost beneath a tide of bone. The warlock, far too frightened to focus on casting a spell, was desperately snatching his robe away from a mass of clawing skeletal arms, but to little avail. The relentless undead pulled him to the floor, and though he grasped its stone tiles as firmly as he could, he was soon dragged away, screaming into the darkness. <laughs> The elf endured the onslaught of the unliving, pinned against the dungeon wall. He swung his burning blade fiercely and with utmost determination. He cleaved through several of the skeletal chaff as the fiends attempted to overwhelm him. For all his might, the elf knew he could not hold back the inevitable tide as the grasping hands latched themselves to his legs and yet more clasped his arms, restricting his movement. Still, the elf struggled and swung his sword once more, except this time it did not be bone, but the hard steel of another's blade. One of the lordly whites had entered the fray. The grim warrior parried the elf's blade and forced it back upon him. The elf swung again, and once more the ghastly lord met the elf's blade with his own and forced the elf's momentum back on him. The elf was caught off balance and staggered against the wall behind him. Seizing the opportunity, the lesser undead hurled themselves upon the elven warrior in an effort to quell any more resistance from their foe. The elf refused to be brought down. Even with a mass of bone encumbering him and unable to swing his sword, he still stood, though he was at his limit. The skeletal lord stepped close. The stench of the grave permeated the cold air around him. His lipless, black-toothed grin opened wide, and from within the awful creature came an inhuman wail that would send all but the most stalwart of men fleeing. The creature raised the hilt of its sword, and with one swift motion, struck the elf in the face with its palm. The elf staggered back against the wall, tripping over the skeletal minions that had latched onto him and sliding down the stone brickwork. His sword slipped from his grasp, and the undead, as they had done with the monk moments before, swarmed the last hero and buried him beneath a pile of emaciated cadavers. The elf's sword lay on the cold stone floor, its flame slowly fading until it, like the heroes, was swallowed by the dark. Hard, blackened steel gauntlets gripped the warlock's shoulders. He, along with his companions, had been bound and dragged to a chamber that resembled a crypt containing dozens of open stone caskets. He had been forced onto his knees before a raised altar by one of the vile whites that had ambushed them in the darkness. It was that same white that now gripped him with the strength of a soldier at the peak of his life, and not a cobwebbed marionette that should be little more than bones and dust. The magics that animated these long-dead lords must be powerful indeed, the warlock thought to himself. 
Ahead of the warlock, ten more of the grim knights knelt upon their black blades in fealty to their silent master, the necromancer, who had not uttered a word, nay, even produced a sound since our heroes were dragged before him. Their weapons and belongings had been placed upon the altar before which the hooded figure stood, though if the fiend had any interest in them, it had not been expressed. He had kept his head bowed and his hands clasped together in what resembled a prayer, though what kind of being a defiler of the dead would venerate was not a thought that should dwell within the minds of decent ordinary folk. To the warlock's left was the monk, whose hands were also bound and was forced upon his knees by another of the skeletal lords. He looked as if he had been hit by a cart and was trying his best not to retch. The warlock couldn't decide if this was because of the beating he had received, the grim scent of death that surrounded them, or because the monk had taken one too many swigs from his water skin. At least he was alive, for now anyway. To the right of the warlock was the elf, battered from his struggle against the minions of the necromancer, though his pride hurt more than his body. He too was held in place by the same cadaverous foe that had challenged him in the darkened hall. What the elf wouldn't give to have his blade in hand, to meet the wretch in genuine combat. For now, however, he could only muster the occasional squirm against his restless warden. Beyond the elf was the rogue, who required no guard as he seemed to be as immobile as a statue. Only his head was in motion, constantly twisting and turning as if the rogue hoped to pull the rest of his body along with it. His frozen stance looked to be one of an imminent attack. Clearly he had failed in his attempt to strike down the master of the undead at the very last moment. Well, at least we now know what became of our master assassin over here, spoke the warlock, not missing an opportunity to chastise one of his companions. Shut up, warlock! retaliated the rogue, furiously throwing his head from side to side. If he could move, there was now a good chance that the warlock would be first to sample his wrath. The monk, tired of the warlock's snide attitude, spoke up. Will you knock it off? We could all be about to die. And you want to spend your last moments being a snarky bitch? Have some dignity, for goodness sake. The warlock spun his head to face the indignant monk. Venom coated his words. Don't lecture me on dignity, you drunken lout. Little good you did against that horde of unliving- It was then, as the warlock spat his insults, that a sound most dreadful and enthralling reverberated through the forsaken crypt. A sound that could chill the blood in the most steadfast of nights and arouse the deepest longing in those of a curious mind. The necromancer spoke. The fated meeting has come. The black-robed figure raised his head and turned to address the subdued heroes and his accursed minions. Travelers, I, Crathul, Oracle of Want, Welcome you to this hallowed congregation. The kneeling undead rasped in anticipation of their master's words. The four heroes remained silent. The necromancer's voice seemed to echo not only from the walls of the crypt, but through the heroes' bodies, as if seeking out an empty place within them all. The strings of desire were pulled, and in the waning days of this world, Fate has delivered back to us a lost lamb of the flock. Crathul's dreadful masked visage turned towards the paralyzed rogue, as did the gaze of his ghastly knights. There was an air of confusion among some of the heroes to what the necromancer's words had met, namely the elf, who, after a few moments, blurted out a bewildered, Huh? The warlock rolled his eyes and sighed. He wondered if his final moments would be spent playing translator for the elven halfwit at his side. Ah, oh, he's saying that our sneaky friend over there is one of his former minions. I am nobody's minion! I have my own will! The rogue bellowed and then desperately strained his body in an attempt to move to no avail. No man's will is truly his own, spoke Crathul. There was an inescapable certainty in his voice. My magic thrums within you. I recognize its melody. Though how you came to escape my direct control, I do not know. It matters little, for soon you shall serve again. If you wish to know who you were before your resurrection, I cannot say, for I have no recollection of it. 
You must have been as insignificant in life as you were a thrall in death. The rogue's head looked as if it might break from his body. The undead assassin wanted nothing more than to shove his dagger down the necromancer's throat. Release me from this spell, necromancer, and I'll show you how insignificant I am. The rogue thrashed about as much as he could, but it was pointless. Crethul had already turned his gaze on to the next adventurer, the elf. The necromancer raised his gauntleted hand and extended a clawed finger towards the warrior. You, elf, fascinate me. The elf, vain and narcissistic, almost blushed at what he perceived as flattery. Well, you, you know, people often say that. Uh, please continue, don't let me stop you. Allow me to be more elucidating. It is not you that I find fascinating, but rather the magics that permeate your being. Oh, I have mastered the necromantic arts and transcended mortality, but I have yet to meet the being to do so without great sacrifice. So, tell me, elf, what price did you pay for eternal life? The warlock suddenly eyed the elf with suspicion, which did not go unnoticed. The elf, thinking quickly, devised an excellent rebuttal. Uh, well, we elves live for a long time. Yep. That's all. Good old elven genetics. Yeah. The warlock snorted with mild amusement at the elf's awful attempt to appease the necromancer's curiosity. This drew the gaze of Crethul to him, which caused the warlock to shrink inside himself. Warlock, your greed and ambition are what led you and the others here to this moment. Guided by the words of my disciples, you followed your dream to this place. Could you make the sacrifice necessary for your desires to become reality? The warlock, quivering in terror under the grip of the skeletal guard, could not muster a single word in response. The only sound he could produce was a pathetic whimper. I thought not. You lack the stomach for it. And what about me, eh? What insights do you have about little old me? I'm dying to hear him. The monk, realizing what he had just said, quickly looked to his companions to apologize. Oh, sorry, fellas. Crethul's deathly visage faced the uppity monk and answered swiftly. You're an overindulgent drunk. The monk chuckled, or hiccuped, and smiled back at the grim sorcerer. Is that it? <laughs> well, guilty as charged, I suppose. But since we're being honest with each other, you're a disgusting freak that belongs in the dirt along with your boys here. The monk could feel the cold grip of his guardian edge its way ever so closer to his neck, ready to silence the monk on his master's whim. Crethul, however, betrayed no sign of offense or anger and simply continued. You are a man of crippling morality and scant ambition, a leftover from a time where you considered restraint and disciplined virtues. The little you long for can be found at the bottom of a tankard. You are a man not worthy of my time and whose only use will be as a ghoul to guard the halls of my abode. This exchange is over. Crethul concluded his conversation with the four heroes and motioned to the opened stone caskets that lined the room and spoke a command to his assembled knights. Seal them away. The skeletal lords obeyed without question and dragged each of the four adventurers to an open sarcophagus, ready to entomb the heroes within their former graves. The elf and the monk both struggled against their soon-to-be internment, while the rogue, unable to retaliate, shouted vulgarities at both the whites and his supposedly former master. Only the warlock forsook his dignity, begging and pleading as the undead dragged him to his coffin. One by one, our heroes were flung into their cramped, dusty prisons, each of them shrieking as the unliving servants of the necromancers hoisted the heavy stone seals atop the caskets and slid them shut. An unknown amount of time had passed, perhaps hours or nearly minutes. It was hard for the elf to tell in that darkened box. The hair-raising excitement he had felt when the necromancer's servants trapped him within the stone casket had already dissipated, and now he was experiencing a sensation he considered far worse. Boredom. The elf had always imagined his final death would be glorious, 
a tale that bards and tavern goers would repeat until the end of time. Yet here he was, trapped within a claustrophobic coffin that was not even his, awaiting the moment that the stone lid would slide away and one of the decrepit knights of Crethul would run him through. A fresh worry crept across the elf's mind. What if they didn't come back? What if it was now the elf's destiny to lay trapped within that crypt for all eternity? Missed by none and forgotten by all! No! This could not be how his story ends! The elf jolted upright in defiance of his fate, only to slam his head against the hard stone lid of the sarcophagus. His body fell back, his head throbbing, as a fear deeper than any he had felt before gripped him. It was at that moment of abject horror that the lid of the elf's casket shifted upon its body. The elf heard the grinding of stone and felt the dust of foregone years fall upon his face. Again the hefty seal budged, inch by inch it slid away. The elf braced himself for the inevitable sight of a decayed lord sent with a malefic purpose. The stone lid fell away with a thunderous crash. If the dead were not already wandering the halls, the sound would have been enough to wake them. The originator of the tumultuous racket was no black guard of the malevolent necromancer, though his rotten form marked him as one of the sorcerer's lesser pets. A twitchy ghoul peered over the edge of the sarcophagus. Yeah, rot balls! The elf exclaimed with relief. He shuffled himself to his feet, standing upright in his coffin. You followed us here. Oh, I knew you liked me, you scruffy little ghoul, you. The elf rubbed the top of the putrid ghoul's head. Strands of hair fell away, and the ghoul emitted what the elf perceived as a sound of contempt. Yeah. The elf, suddenly remembering where he was, glanced around the forsaken crypt. Besides himself and the ghoul, not a creature stirred. Crathul and his guards had evidently left the chamber knowing that the adventurers were securely trapped within. The elf counted only three other sealed sarcophagi, which undoubtedly contained his companions. Turning his back and bound hands toward his slavering savior, the elf made a request. Rotballs, can you chew through these bindings? The ghoul leaned in and nibbled on the ropes which restricted the elf's hands. In a few moments, his jagged teeth had gnawed their way through. Thank you, little guy, said the elf. Swinging himself over the edge of the casket and bounding towards the nearest sealed sarcophagus, the ghoul followed behind. Wasting no time, the elf shoved the lid until the casket was half open and peeked inside. Ah! Screamed to the startled monk. Monk, don't worry. It's just me. I'm getting you out of here. Comforted the elf. The monk screamed once again. Ah! <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. Get me out of here, quick! The elf reached in and hefted his now sobering companion out and began to untie his bonds. Where are the other two? Asked the monk, who then noticed the rotting ghoul crouched behind his lugged friend. Uh, that thing's not going to try and eat me again, is it? The elf chuckled. No! <laughs> or at least I don't think so. Right. The monk was not filled with confidence as his companion moved on to open the next sarcophagus and kept a close eye on the new member of their band. Once again, the elf pushed open the heavy stone seal of the grave. This time, however, its inhabitant leapt from within. His hands latched themselves onto the elf's head as if to break his neck. Realization dawned on the rogue that the figure who had opened his prison was not a minion of the necromancer, but in fact his dim-witted associate. Elf, where is Cthul? The rogue asked, a cold determination in his tone. Uh, I, I don't know, replied a bewildered elf, unsure as to why his companion would be caressing his face. Bah! Spat the rogue, releasing the elf from his murderous grip and immediately climbing out of his casket. The sight of the ghoul gave him pause, but judging by the fact that it wasn't currently devouring either of the two nitwits before him, the rogue surmised that it must not be a threat. Hey, good to see you mobile again, spoke the monk, who was genuinely happy to see that the rogue was once again in control of his body. And now that I am, I'm going to find that blasted necromancer and wring his neck! Nobody makes a fool of me! The rogue's pride had clearly been wounded, thought the monk but unbridled vengeance would likely lead him to his doom. Whoa, now hold up. Don't be so hasty. You couldn't even lay a finger on him last time. Don't go rushing to meet your fate just yet. I say we save the warlock, and then get the hell out of here. What do you reckon, fellas? Let him rot. He'd do the same for us, said the rogue. Mm, maybe, replied the monk. Look, he might be a weasel, but I think even you would agree that he doesn't deserve to be some madman's puppet for all eternity. 
The rogue grumbled in begrudging agreement, and the three heroes made their way to the last of the sealed sarcophagi. The three, in combination, raised the weighty lid stone and placed it gently down on the floor of the crypt. As they did, all three could hear a quiet whimpering coming from within the casket. The three peered down onto their robed colleague who was curled in a fetal position, averting his eyes from what he assumed were the harbingers of his demise. Please, I beg you, I would make a worthy disciple. I have far more value alive than a some shambling corpse, pleaded the warlock. The three rescuers had seen many repulsive sights over the last few days, but none compared to this. Pathetic, muttered the rogue, who turned and walked away from the quivering knave. The warlock, hearing the voice of his undead associate, peeked over his shoulder and rapidly adopted a new demeanor. About time you idiots got me out of here. What? Saving me for last, were you? Yeah, swiftly replied the monk who reached into the sarcophagus to grab the warlock and hoist him up. As he stood up straight, his face came level with the decomposing countenance of Rotballs the Goon. The warlock sprang away with a cowardly shriek. Don't worry, warlock. Rotballs is the one who set me free. He's a good boy, assured the elf. The warlock didn't reply. He was keeping an unflinching gaze on the ghoul that quietly growled at him while the monk untied his bindings. The rogue approached the dark altar on which rested his daggers and the belongings of the rest of the group. He picked up one and closely examined the blade. He thought of Crathul's words. The necromancer had spoken with such certainty and demonstrated the undeniable power he had over him. Was Crathul the man responsible for the rogue's unliving state? What had he raised him to be and who was he before? Questions whose answers the rogue had long abandoned seeking. Now, however, he felt a deep longing take root within him, if not for answers, then for vengeance. The rogue sheathed his blade and then did the same with the second. As he was about to turn and leave, something pricked his curiosity. The strange dark orb that the necromancer had been praying before still sat atop the altar, held in place by a twisted metal stand on which was inscribed a language beyond the rogue's comprehension. The rogue gazed into the rounded crystal, the size of which could easily fit in the palm of a man's hand. As he stared into the object of unholy reverence, the rogue could see the blackness within the crystal swirl and churn as if he was watching the waters of a nighttime sea being pulled towards a hungering vortex. The crypt around him drifted away, and the rogue now felt himself standing upon a precipice, overlooking an all-consuming void, where, if he were to peer too long, he would slip and fall forever. Now that is interesting. The warlock's intrigue snapped the rogue back to reality. How long had he been peering into that accursed object? The warlock seized the orb and held it in the light of the chamber's braziers to examine the strange stone more thoroughly, taking note of the swirling darkness within. What is it, exactly? Inquired the rogue, now curious himself. Not a clue. It's magical, of course, but beyond that, I haven't the foggiest idea. Perhaps it could reveal some of this necromancer's secrets to us. The rogue detected a mild excitement in the warlock's voice and thought it best to remind him that his greed had caused them all to be entombed. Be careful your prying doesn't bring the necromancer's servants down on our heads. Oh, please. As if you hadn't caused that very thing to happen to us in the first place. Rebuked the warlock. No sooner had he spoken those words than a bone-chilling cry echoed throughout the halls of the necromancer's lair. The unliving were on their way. It's all yours, Rogue. The warlock tossed the orb to the rogue who instinctively caught it. Fellas, I think it's best we be leaving. The monk bellowed to his companions. Do we know the way out? Asked the rogue. Uh, Rotballs must know a way out of here. Right, Rotballs? Spoke the elf, looking to his ghoul friend for confirmation. You can lead us out of here, can't you, little guy? The ghoul scratched at his crumbling skin and squawked a noise that yeah. vaguely sounded like affirmation. Putting our lives in the rotting hands of a necromancer's pet. What could go wrong? Shut up and grab your things, warlock. It's time to go, said the rogue, who placed the pilfered orb within a small satchel on his belt. The heroes seized the rest of their belongings from the altar, and the warlock lit the elf's sword one more time with a fiery incantation. The group were ready to make their escape, 
The elf nodded to his eager friend. All right, rock balls, lead the way. Through the darkened halls of the lair of the necromancers, our four heroes ran, guided by a decomposing creature that only one of the group truly trusted. Behind them, they could hear the rattling of bone and metal, a veritable host of hollow men animated by the will of their dark master, now in pursuit of our escapees. As the group fled, they passed the mounds of bones they first witnessed on their descent into the lower halls of the ruin. Only now those formerly silent mass graves spawned forth wicked bone men who flung themselves at our four adventurers, seeking to slow their escape. The elf, with his burning blade, made short work of the emaciated fiends, cleaving them in twain and shattering their weak forms. The monk, using his staff, dislodged the heads from several of the skeletal fiends, whose bodies seemed to then wander about aimlessly in the darkness. The rogue, of course, was in his element. He was faster than the necromancer's disposable marionettes, slashing and stabbing his way through the lesser undead that barred his path. Even the warlock, to his credit, was able to utilize his magic to conjure blasts of green flame, which then caused several of the hero's bony assailants to combust, their scorched pieces being scattered across the dungeon's floors. All the while, the ghoul, known as Rotballs, led the four towards the surface, or so our heroes hoped. Eventually, the group came upon a familiar room, for it was the very chamber in which they first encountered their putrid guide. The darkness here was less oppressive, and quiet confidence built among the group. They were almost out. The feeling did not last long. As the group moved across the hall, the elf raised an arm to signal a halt. He could hear something familiar. A cold wind was blowing. I... I can't move! The rogue shouted to the rest of the group. Indeed, his body was once again as rigid as stone. Fright set in among our four heroes, and in apprehension they cast their gaze back towards the darkened halls that they had fled. At the end of the long passage, illuminated by the torches of his unliving guardsmen, stood Crathul. Without even the faintest gesture from their master, the Black Knights began marching towards the four adventurers. Rothballs the ghoul whined and gestured to a small side passage out of the chamber. The elf thought it best to follow the ghoul's guidance, and within seconds had snatched up the paralyzed robe and carried him under his arm. What the hell are you doing? Put me down! Demanded the rogue, not one to be manhandled like a piece of furniture. The elf paid him no heed and chased after the ghoul who had vanished into the passage. The monk and the warlock, with no other options open to them, followed suit. The passage led to an unremarkable room, except for a small aperture on its far wall which the ghoul had squatted himself next to. Though the adventurers were weary, their eyes played no tricks on them as they beheld the comforting yet dim ray of sunlight shining through the narrow opening. The passage must have been a means of escape for the old inhabitants of the castle, as beyond the opening was a drop down into the murky waters of the lake which surrounded the old fortress island. No doubt, in times past, a boat would have been waiting below a rope ladder to ferry any fleeing nobles to safety. We're going to have to jump, said the monk eager to escape the advancing dead. The elf stood still, pondering for a moment. Hmm. What are you waiting for? Go! Bellowed an agitated warlock. Corpses float. Right? Asked the elf. What are you? Wait! No! No, 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 no! A baffled rogue soon found himself hurtling out the narrow opening as the elf flung him from the dungeon into the lake below. All right, let's go, lads, said the monk who then dived into the opening and hit the water with a resounding splash. The elf, being the tallest of the group, crouched and edged his way through the opening. He paused and looked back at the unusual ghoul who had saved him and his companions. Rockballs, you're coming with us, right? The ghoul twitched and shook his head in refutation. Yeah. It could not follow them. A melancholy mood washed over the elf, knowing that he may never see his new friend again. Rockballs! I swear by my glory that one day I shall return to this place and I will set you free. On my honor, I will see- Get a move on! Ordered an impatient warlock, firmly kicking the elf in the rear which sent him plummeting into the water below. The ghoul hissed at the thoroughly unpleasant magician and scurried away back into the darkness of the dilapidated ruin. The warlock stepped through the aperture and beheld the dull water of the lake and the gray clouds above, never having been so thankful as to see an overcast sky. He prepared to jump when suddenly his robe was wrenched back, 
Latching onto the mossy stone brickwork, the warlock looked back to see the fleshless face of one of Corthul's knights, who had gripped the back of his robes with one black steel-clad hand, while the other held a wicked blade. The warlock, so close to freedom, clung to the limestone in death-defying desperation. The undead lord would not relent and continued to try to pull the warlock back within the darkness of the necromancer's domain. Refusing to return to his grim prison, the warlock, with no other options available to him, resolved to take a risk. Holding firmly to the stonework with one arm, he extended the other, palm open towards the bony visage of the undead lord, and spoke a short incantation. A violent blast of fire erupted from the warlock's open hand, which sent the would-be captor reeling back into the darkness as the warlock plunged into the murky waters beneath. The warlock surfaced and pulled down the lower part of his cowl to breathe as he floundered about in the cold water. The monk, who calmly bobbed next to him, looked up at the small cloud of smoke blowing away from the escape passage above. What? Were you having a party up there or something? He said to a panicking and drenched warlock. <coughs> Get swimming, you dolts! Shouted the warlock, who immediately began making for the shore of the lake. On it! Replied the elf, who was using the immobile rogue as buoyancy and began to kick his feet. The rogue continuously spat out muddy water as they crossed the surface of the lake. Can't you swim any faster? He asked wanting very much for his humiliation to end. As the heroes reached the southern shore of the lake, the warlock wrung out what water he could from his soaking robes. The elf and the monk helped the rogue out of the water as his body began to loosen, the necromancer's power over him seemingly waning once enough distance was between the two. There was, however, no time for our heroes to rest. The minions of Cthulhu would likely be in pursuit. They resolved to keep moving, putting as much distance as they could between themselves and that profane castle of dark sorcery. Before departing, the elf looked out over the lake to the island on which stood the deceptively silent ruin. He thought once more of the strange ghoul that was his and the other's salvation, not knowing if they would meet again. Then he turned and joined his companions as they sprinted away from the place that was nearly their tomb, the sun slowly declining behind them. The group had traveled for several hours and night had drawn in. They had made southward through rocky hinterlands and came upon a small cave hidden in the foothills of a snow-capped mountain range on the borders of a dense forest. They had set up camp within the cave, weary from their delve into and escape from the necromancer's lair. They gathered around the fire the warlock had conjured, warming themselves and attempting to dry out their damp belongings. For a while, none of them said a word, each quietly reflecting on what had transpired within that godforsaken dungeon. It was the monk who finally broke the silence. <sighs> well, we made it, fellas. Sure, there wasn't much loot to be had, but in the end, we made it out alive. Well, so to speak, we could be thankful for that. I'll drink to that. <laughs> uh, if I had a drink, spoke the elf. Here, still got a little left. The monk chucked his almost empty water skin to the elf, who took a swig. That's not bad, said the elf, wiping some of the alcoholic brew from his mouth. Ah, thought you might like that. I know I do, replied the monk with a cheeky grin. The rogue sat in quiet contemplation, twiddling one of his throwing knives between his fingers. His thoughts were once again on the necromancer, who had humiliated him and escaped his blade. And, for the first time in years, he thought about his life before his resurrection. At least, he wondered what it was like for he had no memory of it or his supposed service to the Dark Sorcerer. He struck his knife into the log he sat upon. I want to know more about this necromancer, Crithul. Who is he? I'm more interested in that little curio we found. Whatever it is, I'm sure it could reveal to us the secret of this necromancer's power, and perhaps a way to kill him, said the warlock, piquing the rogue's interest. Of course, we'd have to take it somewhere with the facilities to study it. I won't be unraveling any of its secrets out here in the wilderness. Then our goal's alive, warlock. If you can promise to make it worth my while, I'll make sure you return alive 
to civilization. The rogue said, the hint of a threat coating his words. Of course, of course. The warlock readily agreed. Oh, well, gents, it's a hell of a journey to any city. It took us long enough to get here from the north, and I don't think we should be heading back that way, said the monk. Agreed, concurred the warlock. The monk thought for a moment, trying to recollect any useful information about the group's current whereabouts. If my wits don't fail me, I believe there's an old fishing village to the south, past the mountains. We might be able to find transport there. Are you suggesting we traipse over a dangerous mountain range with the hope that your memory hasn't been dulled from years of drinking? Asked the warlock, not keen on the idea of exerting himself on the way up the snowy peaks. Oh, I love mountains. Who knows what kind of incredible monsters we might encounter on the way over. Ogres? Yetis? Wyverns? A boar? Said the elf, speculating in excitement. If that doesn't take your fancy, warlock, we can also travel through the forest. It winds around the mountains to the west. It will take us longer, but saves you a little discomfort, said the monk teasingly. The rogue chimed in. If any of the necromancer's minions happen to be on our tail, the trees of the forest will help keep us hidden from any pursuers trying to spot us from a distance. Yes, and they'll also conceal an ambush that we may very well wander into. I have no doubt that bandits operate in these lawless regions, responded the warlock, cynical as always. Uh, well, whatever you fellas decide, we'll set off in the morning after Brecky. As for now, I'm bloody knackered. Time to get some shut-eye, I think," said the monk, stretching out his aching body and yawning ever so slightly. Oh, I know! I'll find us something to eat. It's not like I need to sleep," said an eager elf, jumping to his feet. He grabbed his sword and ran out of the cave in a jolly spirit. Should we go after him? Nah, he'll be fine, responded an apathetic warlock, turning himself over on the cave floor to sleep. I'll stand guard," said the rogue, picking up his daggers and heading to take up position on the outside of the cave's entrance. Uh, all right, mate. Don't murder the elf while we're asleep," said the monk jokingly. "I'll try not to," replied the rogue earnestly. The rogue stepped outside the cave and leaned against the rocky outcrop. Below the sloping elevation that had led to their concealed campsite, the rogue could hear the elf charging around amongst the trees. Swinging his sword at some nocturnal critter that was, by the sound of it, eluding him quite well. Moonlight shone down upon their temporary sanctuary. The sky was filled with a myriad of stars that twinkled gently above the rising mountains to the south. It was quite tranquil, save for the occasional sound of the elf's sword hitting a tree or stone. The rogue gazed up at the sky in what was, for him, a rare moment of calmness. It didn't last long, as soon his mind wandered to thoughts of vengeance against the man, or being, he currently knew little about. It was then that he realized that his hand had come to rest on the small satchel that hung from his belt, containing the strange crystal orb that had been placed so reverently upon the necromancer's altar. He instinctively withdrew his hand and folded his arms, shaking the thoughts of vengeance from his mind and composing himself for his nightly vigil. The elf continued to chase critters, 